Examine yourself. So one way is that the purpose of examining yourself is just really to prevent. And the purpose is prevention, but prevention from what? Prevention from failure. And we see in Luke 14, I love, love, love this scripture from verse 28 to 35. It says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you. They'll laugh at you like, shouldn't you know? And my mom says that to me all the time when I get stuck in something, she's like, didn't you think about it before you started it? That's a part of the ridicule, right? Verse 30 says, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish it. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Verse 34 says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So pretty much, and I love the whole entire scripture in Luke 14, the gospel really where God is continuing to take his disciples and those who gather to watch him. And he's teaching them principles to be able to go through journeys in their life, right? And even though this specific principle is not meant for marriage, we can still definitely take it for marriage for anything really that you're looking to embark on in your life, you wanna make sure before you embark on it, are you prepared? And so before you even think about let's set the date, let's buy the dress and all of those fancy stuff, you should begin to stop and look at yourself because marriage is a very sacred institution and marriage is meant for a purpose. So it's not just let's just come together and create a beautiful family God's institution for marriage was really to show the example between him and his church. So literally we are on display. So when the word of God says in Luke, and it says in Luke that the Lord began to speak when people began, when, when people gathered, then he's like, all right, I got my crowd. Let me give them something to listen to. Right. And so when we come together in marriage, people are looking at the people of God and what we, how we display our marriage, even though sometimes people can display a very good scene on the outside, when you go back home, you want to make sure that you have the same thing at home and it is possible. So you need to begin to prepare. It also says in Revelations 19, six through eight, in the, from the NIV, NIV version, it says that I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of wash, rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the land has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean was given her to wear. So even Christ is preparing for us. We know that as we're going through our journey in life, it's really preparing for that marriage feast that we're getting ready to embark on if we make it through till the end, right? So as you go in marriage, some people don't say, well, I'm going to marriage to only make it two, three years. They're seeing a lifetime, but then things come up and they realize, I don't think I have what it takes. So when you're prepared, you begin to take a look ahead and begin to figure out what is it that I need that is going to be able to get me through that. Even if, you know, say for instance, there's a problem that you prepared for and you don't experience it, that's great. But what happens if there's a problem that you face that you have not prepared for and you experience it, you're going to get crippled in that situation. You're going to get stuck because you don't know how to make it through. The same way how Christ is preparing for us and preparing that marriage feast, there's this whole idea of just being clean, right? And so Christ didn't bring us to himself and says, you need to be clean before you come. 
No, that's not the way it works. He's saying throughout the process, I'm going to be cleansing you because there is a great feast that I'm preparing you for and your garments have to be spotless. So it's not saying that when we get into marriage, everything needs to be great. I need to be perfect. My partner needs to be perfect. That's not reality. But you at least have to be willing, right? So as believers, we're willing to go through the process of cleansing with God. That's what happens when we give our lives to Christ. That's what happens when we accept Christ into our lives. And when we actually get baptized, that's our expression to the world. This is what, this is a choice that I've made. And it's an open, open declaration of an inward choice that you've made. That's the same thing with marriage. You don't have to be perfect when you come together to get married. You have to be willing, though, to go through the journey of being refined. So marriage is not just about, oh, we're going to live and we're going to live happily ever after. We're going to buy a huge house. Are you willing to be refined? And I think that's the question that you have to ask. And so the word clean, and, and I, was, I was looking at this. I don't know why this word really stuck out to me as I was reading Revelation 19. And I'm like, Lord. When I'm in, in my marriage, I'm literally being cleaned. Like the Lord is using my spouse to clean me. So it's not just a natural thing that we're doing. It's a spiritual part that is so powerful. When my husband and I got married, I had so many things that I came to the marriage with. So I was looking forward to the phase of the honeymoon phase. And I don't know if anyone else can identify with this, but we didn't have that. What we're living right now is that honeymoon phase and we're six years into the marriage. But when my husband and I first got together and we got married, we were at each other's throat, left and right. We couldn't agree on anything. I watched the way he's functioned. I'm like, you're really like that? Like who raised you? And then he's looking at me and he's like, you really deal with problems like that? Who raised you? And we were just literally going back and forth with each other. And I'm like, everyone just kept on saying, oh, there's this great honeymoon phase. And I'm like, I'm still waiting for it. But as we went through the process and the Lord started to deal with me, because it's in marriage that you begin to see yourself. It's in marriage that your spouse is literally there like, boop. And that's what the Holy Spirit does, right? As um, Pastor Michael spoke about, the Holy Spirit's job is to really touch on some parts of your life where he's like, I know you gave your life to me, but now you got to be transformed. I know you gave your life to me, but now I got to deliver you from some things. And our spouses, the people who are close to us. So you go from your mom and your dad, your siblings, who are the ones who kind of like they're closest to you and they touch on everything, to your spouse, who you have to sleep with at nighttime. At least with your siblings, they could go to their room if you have that luxury. And you can go to your room or whatever it is. But your spouse, you got to be sleeping with them in bed. And then you hear scriptures like, don't go to bed with this. With, don't go to bed with the, with the sun, with wrath, right? Don't, don't let the sun go down and you have wrath in your heart. And you're like, all right, Holy Spirit. So you're forcing me to make it right. So we see how the Lord can use our spouse and the word clean, um, uh, the Greek word for clean is katharos, which pretty much means pure. It's a purification process that we go through in marriage and we have to be ready for that. What's happening during the purification process is there's a separation. So we know that we were all raised to think certain ways, to be certain ways. We got a lot of junk. Whether you want to admit it or not, we've got a lot of junk that we did not just say, I want to receive this, I want to receive this. But of course, through our experiences and our interactions, our parents' junk, their parents' junk, all of everybody's junk, it just kind of like passes down and you have it. Now you get together with the spouse who went through the same process of their parents and their parents and their parents junk, and you come together with a whole lot of junk. Now you got to go through the process of this separation from all of that junk. So I was, I was happy to see that there was a Greek word that really broke down the process of setting oneself apart. So as you're getting into marriage, you're agreeing to set yourself apart. Yourself, the self that you've always known prior to marriage, to then build a new identity and a new self. We're filled with various types of mixtures, right? Mixtures of your aunties, mixtures of your uncles, moms, dads, everybody. You're filled with ways of thinking. You're filled with expectations. You're filled with unresolved issues from childhood. And you got to be prepared to separate yourself from those things. We must be purified and we have to be willing. So you don't have to have it before you get married but you've got to at least be willing to be positioned 
to go through it. According to Barton and Bryant uh, 2016, 40% of marriages in the United States, in the United States, and in divorce. And according to Wright 1997, marriage is one of God's greatest school of learning. It can be a place where a husband and a wife are refined. So you got to ask yourself, am I willing to go through that process? And we didn't grow up just kind of like hearing marriage in that context. We just grew up hearing marriage. just this great, you know, part of our lives and everyone anticipates it, but we don't hear it in the context of you're going to be refined. You're going to be tried. You're going to go through a wilderness, but if you have the necessary tools, you will be able to make it through. And I love the way how um, Pastor Michael pretty much reframed the wilderness journey, even though in the natural sense, the wilderness is never anything good, right? Because there is no cultivation in the wilderness. There's no sustainability of life in a wilderness. So in the natural logical sense, the wilderness is not a good place, but God uses those things and he turns them around for good where he uses that same natural thing that's not good and makes it good for us. So it's a place where in one side, in the natural sense, there's no cultivation to the other spiritual side where he cultivates us and our character and our spirit in the wilderness. So where do we begin? We begin with self-examination. And some of the questions that you wanna ask yourself when you are preparing to get into marriage is, am I ready? Do I understand my purpose? So do you even know what you were created for? Because the idea of marriage is not just to have a partner, it's to have a partner to do purpose with, right? So you know your purpose, and then God says, but I created this person, and I'm going to bring y'all together to fulfill the same purpose. Now, it may not be the same assignment, and I use my husband and me, for example, like my husband, he's a pastor, and he preaches. There's people who he ministers to, but I'm on the other side where I use my, um, my skills around mental health, and I really use it in a very spiritual way. So my husband's like a really strong pa pastor. I'm not a pastor, and he's a preacher. But I'm more of a speaker. And when we come together, we're a dynamic duo. We're, we're operating in the same church and in the same ministry, but in different capacities. And so I did not um, you know, know that I would have been married to him one day, but God had a purpose for me in the body where I am to the point where the ministry that he was in, that he's been you know, growing and, and really uh, maturing the saints in that congregation, but there was a missing piece where they were just kind of like going through the flow and not really dealing with issues and not really experiencing real deliverance. And God is saying, well, I got a piece for that. So he put me through this whole process of gaining all of this experience with mental health and saying, they need that. So when my husband and I came together at the time, the church didn't have a mental health ministry. We got one now, right? And I give God thanks for that because this congregation was just like, oh, psychology, like we're not, we're not going there. But over the years, and I've been there for six years, and they've never embraced this, this, this component. Now they're so thirsty for it that they are developed, they've, they've developed a mental health ministry, and they're asking me, what topics can we do? We need this. The people are asking for this. It's ways to, to benefit the community. And so you can see how God can bring two people who may have different assignments, and it may be the same, but it's the same ministry. We're ministering to the hearts of people in different capacities. You want to ask yourself, do I understand myself, right? Do I understand why I operate the way that I do? Do I, can I make sense of my behaviors? Do I know my needs? Do I know gaps in my life? Do I know why I hurt? Do I know, do I know anything about me? Do I understand how I operate? Am I sacrificial? And the reason why I want to say, do I understand myself? Because there's a process in marriage where you got to teach your spouse, you, so they don't come and say, I've been studying you for five years and I realized I'm gonna marry you. No, they don't understand you. So you've got to teach them you. And there's times where we can only present to people what we want them to see. And there could be a side of us that we lock away. In order for them, in order for you to teach your spouse you, you first have to know you. Am I sacrificial? So are you coming to the marriage saying, this is mine and this is yours? You got to be able to sacrifice. And that's what Jesus Christ was saying in Luke 14, right? In order for you to get on this journey, you got to be able to deny yourself. And you got to ask yourself when you're getting into marriage, are you willing to deny yourself? Am I a self-aware person? And how do I manage my emotions? And we're going to get into emotions a little bit. But also, what is my mindset? What are my expectations? Are they realistic? 
expectations and fantasies is something that people always come into the marriage with. And so you have, even as young girls, we have magazines, we have our Barbie dolls, we have Ken, is it Ken and Barbie or one of them? I don't know, Ken and Barbie, you see them and you see these perfect pairs and you see the beautiful dresses and you see the white picket fence, right? And you're like, that's gonna be my, my family. That's what you're anticipating. But are, is that realistic? And you're saying my spouse is gonna be this and my spouse is gonna be that. And then when you actually get into it, your spouse ain't none of that stuff. Then we have standards and goals that you wanna think about. Where's your mindset as far as the standards that you have and goals that you have? I've counseled so many women who started off with standards that were here. And as they started dating, their standards literally like went down. Like, I, and, and I have to allow them to draw them into that. Like, did you realize how low your standards have went? Because you feel like the things that you desire is not real for you. So even though we see unrealistic expectations, what you don't want is as a woman of God to lower your standards because you feel like even the expectations that you have that you cannot attain that. When it comes to God and who God says we are as children of God, this royal priesthood, and who we are as women of God and men of God, we got to use that as our identity. And I'm willing to wait until God brings that reality to me. So in one sense, it may be unrealistic, but when you look at God's word, that's where you begin to form this mind that is really real and you're not going to stop until you get that. You want to think about your values as a believer of God. Do I have to lower my values in a marriage? I was talking with this one girl who just recently went through a breakup and she was having a really hard time adjusting. She was with this guy for four years. And as we're talking, she's like, you know, I have these Christian values and I have all these things I believe with and I'm, I'm, and I'm living with, we were living together. So at first, when she started talking to me about him, I thought that they were married and when we started to get to the root of it, after a few, I was like, oh, y'all are, y'all weren't married. And she was like, no, we're not married. I was like, well, why don't you tell me a little bit more then about your Christian values? And when we went into it, she started off with real strong Christian values. But as she went in the relationship, because her and the guy that she was dating weren't really on the same page over time, she lost that. And so we got to make sure that we have our values and they're strong and we're sticking to them and understanding why we have them. We got to know the roles of a husband. We got to know the roles of a wife before we even get into it, because you can be going in with one mindset. And he's like, you're saying, hey, I grew up with roles where there were no gender roles. My father did the dishes. My father, you know, uh, did, uh, did the laundry. My father cooked and my father did all these things. And he's coming in and saying, well, we didn't do that in my family. And so you're coming in expecting him to do laundry, wash dishes and all this stuff and literally get into like big conflicts over this expectation or over this view that you had about what roles would look like that people literally merge into two different directions because you're not fulfilling my expectation as far as a role. So what do we need to do? Like, what are the tools that we need, right? So we can't just outline all of these things that we need to discuss, but understanding, well, where do we, where do we get that? It's great if we have parents who could really teach us these things and really prepare us for marriage. Um, aside from just telling, you know, as women, this is what you're supposed to do. This is your responsibility. And as men, this is what you're supposed to do. But where you actually begin to break down these different parts of marriage. And that happens in the space sometimes. First and foremost, it is through prayer. And so you want to make sure that your relationship with God is being built first before you even think about building a relationship with anybody else. You wanna make sure that you're connecting and hearing from God first before you start to acquire another sound from somebody else that's supposed to be intimately connected to you. You gotta be intimate, intimately connected with God, right? And so there's a space of God revealing to you what your purpose is. There's a space of God revealing to you, hey, there's somebody else that I'm bringing in the picture for you to do this with. And you understand that it's not just us going through the moment of loving each other right now, but we have something that's driving our purpose in marriage and understanding that God, it's a divine assignment. It's a divine um, connection that God is bringing and you value it so, so much so that you're willing to hold on to it. But also with prayer, there's some other realistic practical things that we could do, right? which is premarital counseling. My husband and I, I'm so glad that we did that. We went to, we had a premarital um, counseling class that we went to, I believe it was eight to 10 weeks or something like that. 
And we started to discuss so many different topics where there were things that I learned where his mind was at and he learned where my mind was at. And we were like, wow, we're in two different spaces. Let's talk about it and make sure that we're in alignment. So that way, when we do get into marriage and things come up, we're not discussing it at that moment. We already discussed this. Did you? And I can point it back to, I was like, you remember that time we were in the third class and you said that? Well, this is this moment right now, right? We're doing Thanksgiving at my parents' house because that's what we discussed in premarital counseling. And we're doing another holiday, you know, New Year's at your parents' house because we already talked about this rather than just being in the moment and saying, well, what are we going to do? And his parents telling him something, putting this expectation and my parents telling me something, they're able to say, well, my wife and I, we discussed this and this is what we're going to do. We have a plan. So pre premarital counseling prepares couples to deal with very is various issues that arise in a marriage. For example, there was a study that I was reading um, quite a few weeks ago that was conducted in 2019 that explored the topics that were of more concern for couples based on their gender. So men and female, before you go into a marriage, like what would you like to, to discuss or what would you like to plan around? Well, the study revealed that women were more concerned about receiving education on reproductive reproduction health and decision-making just around reproductive issues. And so before we even get in marriage, if I wanna start having kids two years, how do I prevent that? If we have two kids and I wanna stop, what do I do? Why is the woman thinking about that? Because we're bearing the children and it's our body. And that's a, that's a topic that's important to us. Now, what happens if I have this idea of what I wanna do with my body and my husband and I are not discussing that from the beginning? Do marriages end because women don't wanna have children and men do? Yes. Do people get into really big arguments just over having children and how many? My father-in-law had the nerve to look at me, they up here from Florida, and had the nerve to ask me if I was giving him more grandchildren. I was like, what? Do you not see how stressed out I am? So this is a conversation that my husband and I, we are on agreement. We're not having any more children, right? We're done. But sometimes it don't go that easy. His parents could be putting a battery in his back and saying, we need more grandchildren. And then he's all stressed out. He said, wife, give me more children. I'm not giving you any more children. And it could be a whole back and forth. We want to eliminate that. So there's some skills that we want to begin to accumulate. And there's, there's skills that you can acquire and learn in premarital counseling, skills such as communication. And I know that communication sounds easy, but it's not. I sit in sessions with couples. There's this couple who I'm counseling even right now. The last session went downhill quick. I was like, man, this is the reason why we should actually be in person. Zoom is not working. And he was communicating about something. She was hearing it totally different. He got so upset and he was just like, I'm out of here. And he walked away. And I said to her, I was like, this is the skills that we talked about last week, not yelling, not being angry, like all of that stuff. That is, this, this is great. Like they were embarrassed, but I'm like, this is great because I get to see you in the element. And then you get to understand the reasons why we're discussing and acquiring the skills that we're acquiring because this is the moment to use it right now. So premarital counseling pretty much gives you the tools that you may not need in the moment, but as you're along the journey, you're able to go to your toolbox and you're able to say, I got a, I got a tool for that. There's a problem. I got a tool for that. Communication tools problem solving tools, decision making tools. Decision is difficult. This couple that I was telling you about, the wife wanted to buy a house. The husband felt like they weren't financially ready to buy a house. The wife is like, I am very goal oriented. The husband's like, well, I'm very logical. And they were literally going back and forth to make a decision just on purchasing a house that led to a huge conflict. So decision making in itself is a skill sometimes that people have to learn and acquire. Financial liter literacy. How many couples divorce just because they weren't financially ready? How many couples actually go into marriage already in debt? So the wife is in debt, the husband is in debt, and we just coming together with all of our debt. <laughs> and then we gotta ask ourselves, what are we gonna do about that with no plan, no, pre no preparation, and how are we gonna eliminate this debt, right? Some couples come together, not even knowing that their spouse have debt, right? And then you come and you're like, oh, okay, let's open up a bank account together. Nah, that's not gonna be a good idea. Well, why not? They're gonna take all of our stuff. What? 
No, you, I have watched couples like that where the wife is like, all right, we're going to plan. We're going to do this. And then even in session, they'll be like, well, let's open up this account and let's start building. And he's like, no, we can't do that. And the wife is like, why we can't do that? And you're like, yeah, IRS is asking me to go and garnish everything. Shouldn't that be talked about even before we said I do that I can make a decision if I want to take on your IRS stuff? So premarital counseling helps you to discuss stuff like that. So the purpose of preparation is to prevent failure, right? And also to prevent divorce. So according to Wright in his book, um, his book called The Premarital Counseling Handbook, it outlines four unidentified reasons why marriages fail. These are unidentified. So the things that we can think about probably is infidelity, finances, like I just mentioned, and I have that on my list too. But he's like, these are some of the things that people don't really identify until like after the fact. So one is lack of knowledge about the processes of development of the other individual. So we know that we all have our, you know, developmental processes that we go through. And even like when we're in marriage, like in our 30s, for us females, 30 and 40s, we're already de dealing with identity transitions, trying to figure things out. We have men who are in their 40s, who's going through midlife crisis, who's like, what do I do with my life now? How do I transition? How do I pivot? I don't know. And the other spouse has to deal with that because sometimes it plays out in our emotions, in our behaviors, in the way we connect with our spouse. We're dealing with our own um, stress that they begin to feel because we understand that stress is not something that just impacts you emotional, your emotions affect the entire family, the husband, the children. And when you're not able to really understand and identify, well, my spouse is probably going through some you know, process of development in their life that I can at least understand and I can empathize and I can support. When you have no prior knowledge of that, it can lead to failure in a marriage. What season is my spouse in? So there are times like even in the marriage that you're going through seasons with God and God is like, all right, I have you through a trying season, a season of identifying yourself, a season maybe of birthing something new in you and your spouse is not aware or privy to, well, God has you going through the season because of the lack of communication that they don't understand the reasons why you shut away for fast and for seven days. Seriously. Did we even discuss that we're going to be in fasting for seven days? Well, I'm going through a season in my life and I got to see God. Well, what that got to do with me? Well, the thing about it is even in fasting, it requires communication. Because if I'm going through a season where God is trying to birth something in me and my spouse doesn't understand that I need to pull away, it's not that I don't love you. It's not that I don't want to experience intimacy with you. This is something between me and God. Didn't he tell you that? Sometimes I tell my husband, I'm like, Joseph heard from Jesus. Joseph heard from the Holy Spirit, okay? Maybe you need to connect with God so you can hear from him too to understand what's happening with me. That's what happened with Mary and Joseph. Joseph was like, oh, I'm about to put this woman away. And God's like, don't do that. What I have going on in her is the Holy Spirit. So Mary didn't have to advocate for herself. The Holy Spirit was doing that. So even in a marriage, when you're connecting spiritually, that's why it's important to have devotional time together and times of seeking the Lord, that even when you're going through a phase where I'm going through a new season in my life, God is elevating me and it does require some separation. It does require some solitude with the Lord. The Holy Spirit is telling the same thing to my spouse and we're on the same page. We also have um, another reason why marriage fails, inadequate foundation on which personal identity and security is built. And according to Bowen's family systems theory, now I don't just ascribe to a lot of these theories. I take what I need and I leave the rest alone, right? Because there's this whole thing about evolution that I will never believe in, but we are evolving as women and men of God. But what is so good to really look through the lens of um, uh, Bowen's uh, theory, his theory on the family system is that we can understand how our family, the emotions and the things that they go through impacts everyone. It impacts the entire family. And even when one person is coming from one family unit and they're getting ready to merge with you know, their spouse or whatever the case may be, they're coming with stuff that is going to not only impact them, but impact their entire children and stuff like that. So it's really good to have a lens because there's this whole part of differentiation of self. It's one of 
um, Bowen's eight concepts of differentiation of his family system theory and this idea, this idea of knowing your own self and your own identity. So differentiation, differentiation is a process of being able to separate yourself, differentiate yourself from that of your entire family. So I don't have to take on my entire family's identity. As they're going through, I don't have to take it on and internalize it. I can literally separate myself from that. But there's also this part of knowing how to manage your emotions. And so being and not allowing your behaviors to be so much influenced by your emotions, but also influenced by rationalization, influenced by your ability to think logically. And I almost feel like a hypocrite saying that because last week I'm here preaching about Abraham and talking about Abraham's faith and faith. There's no logic in faith. And sometimes you got to step out. We know that there's a space where faith needs to be in operation, but there's also a time where you need to be thinking logically and differentiation really speaks to your ability to do that. Why? Because when you go into marriage, if you're just operating off of your emotions and your spouse, because I believe in Bowen theory, he, he was basically saying like, if one person has a low differentiation of self, so their inability to really be able to separate themselves from the identity of the entire family, their inability to function in a way where they're going based on rationalization and really thinking things out and not being driven by their emotion, they actually connect with other spouses who's on the same level of differentiation. And what happens is it impacts the children. So you got this whole dysfunctional family who don't know how to control their emotions impacting and it's leading down to generations. According to Bowen, people with poorly differentiated self depend greatly on the acceptance and approval of other, others and adjust easily to please others or the complete opposite. They become very controlling and they become bullies. We see that in marriage all the time. People with a well-differentiated self is self-aware and they're very clear-headed. There's also this process of feeling like, because I don't really know myself, I begin to try to create that. So you try to create like this perfect family and everything has to be perfect. My children has to grow up and become, go to elite colleges and they have to become lawyers. And I'm going to make sure that happens. I had a client like that who literally had a mental breakdown, who was in therapy. She's a vice president of a major corporation. Her first session with me, she's like, I did everything. I put my son through school. I, I control this. It's because of me why we have this house. My husband doesn't know how to manage any finances. And she's creating all of this on the outside looking in. She really created a powerful dynamic family. But on the inside, they're literally broken. Because she's sitting in her first session saying to me, why is it that I've accumulated all of this, but I still feel so much pain inside? Differentiation of self. There's also this appearance, like I have to appear to be well, or I have to appear to be put together, or this is what people are expecting to see from my family, because this is what they think they know about me that is so false. So marriage becomes more of an accessory rather than a ministry, right? So we have to know that our identity must be found in Christ. Acts 17 verse 28 in the NIV version says, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So our identity has to first begin with God, continue with God and end through God. There's no point where we leave our identity with Christ, in Christ, out of the picture. Another reason for marriage failure is unresolved issues that people bring into the marriage relationship. So we've talked about it, but it really goes on to the other concept that um, Bowen does have, which is called multi-generational issues. And pretty much it's not just that your parents are passing on their issues to you, but it's this idea that even their parents are passing it down. So it's a multi-generational thing that literally continues unless you're able to identify the pattern and then interrupt it. According to Bowen, relationally and gen genetically transmitted information through conscious teaching or through automatic and unconscious programming interact to shape an individual self. So we see these repeated patterns that if you're not aware of will continue, but with self-awareness, you're able to make sure that you are dealing with it and interrupting the pattern. 
The fourth and last thing is couples are not prepared to handle challenges and expectations that are unrealistic. So people kind of like go in to marriage with this, you know, laissez-faire type of attitude, like, oh, it is what it is. And when the time comes, like, we'll deal with it. When the time comes, you're going to fail because you can't wait until trials come to be like, oh, let me go prepare for this. You've got to be preparing for trial way ahead of time so that you're able to withstand that storm, as Luke 14 was saying. And of course, I added in, because we need to know this, that the top, one of the top common reasons for marriage failure is financial stress. According to Crapo et al. 2021, financial stress in a marriage leads to lower marital satisfaction. When you got all that stress, how are you going to have any satisfaction? Who's laughing? Who wants to have a good time? Who wants to be affectionate? I got some stuff on my mind. I'm thinking about how we're going to pay the mortgage that's coming next week. And you're talking about when we plan in our vacation. How can we enjoy being on a vacation knowing that when we come back, we got how many credit cards that we got to pay off? How can you possibly experience satisfaction that way? Increased conflicts and higher risk of divorce. So what do we do? I can't just be outlining all those problems and not giving anything about what we can do about them, right? We know that there's hope in Christ Jesus, and he gives us wisdom on certain processes that we can take to be able to prepare, but also deal, because there, I'm sure that there's some marriages in here that may have identified with some of the things that I've talked about, but there's hope even in that. We need to unlearn in order to relearn, right? So it's a whole process of literally reprogram reprogramming how you see things. Unlearn means to discard something learned, especially like a bad habit from one's memory. So I wanna get rid of this because it's not profiting me and my spouse any good. And I gotta learn something new. So the idea of interrupting the pattern is that you've realized how it's impacted your family, how it's impacted your marriage, how it's not working, and you have the wisdom to do it differently. It is never too late to start or restart. When both spouses are undergoing the process of growth, and I believe Michael mentioned this earlier, a longer and healthier relationship is possible. And that's from right 1997. Like, I'm not just growing. You're growing too. How many people get frustrated when they feel like I'm really trying to make myself better and you just keep sitting around doing nothing? That creates frustration and it's imbalance in a marriage. So as you're pursuing your dreams and you're going forward and you're growing in the Lord, when your spouse is doing the same thing, there's this energy that comes in this motivation where one spouse is encouraging the other because there's no room for jealousy because you're doing your thing too, girl. And he's doing his thing too. So we don't have to compete. We're just making ourselves stronger together, that dynamic couple. And you wanna be solution focused. So you don't wanna be the type of couple where we just keep identifying the problem over and over and over again. We've identified it. Now, what are we going to do about it? What's our plan? How are we gonna interrupt the pattern and how we're going to go in the opposite direction? It's kind of like when we get saved, you confess your sins, great. God doesn't keep us there and say, keep confessing them over and over and over. And he doesn't come back and say, remember what you did before you got saved? He's like, go thy way and sin no more. Let's move on past here. We can see that same pattern and style with Jesus Christ as he was going through and he was ministering to people. He set them straight and he's like, all right, be about your business. We don't have to keep dwelling on the same thing over and over. As a couple, you don't want to do that. So according to Murray et al. 2004, solution-focused therapy, and it is a therapy, a model that I use oftentimes in my sessions because couples will come and they will be talking about the same problem that we talked about five months where are we going? Okay. And the girl, the wife wants to, well, I got to address this. I'm like, we addressed this two weeks ago. We're going to put a plan in place at this point, right? It focuses on the solution and not the problem. The problem keeps you anxious. The problem keeps you depressed. The problem creates frustration. The plan gives you hope. It emphasizes solution focused therapy emphasizes the present and future and does not dwell on the past. It identifies what works and seeks to replicate it. A few weeks ago, I was talking to the congregation, we were talking about different ways to address your mental health. And I'm like, there's certain things that we've been through already that has worked and you know is successful. And you talk about the victory, but you don't tell them the how. 
The how is the important part because if I'm gonna encourage somebody or try to lead somebody to a place of victory, I can't just tell them, you know, I just got delivered and you know, I was struggling with this and Jesus, how did you do it? I just cleared up all my debt. How did you do it? I was so depressed on Tuesday and by Thursday, I was just feeling so good. How did you do it? Tell me the how. So that's what solution focused therapy does. It emphasizes what works. And once you're able to identify it, don't forget it. You wanna make sure that you're keeping that in your toolbox that when something comes up again, you're replicating so that way you can get the same positive result. You wanna learn and implement effective communication and problem solving skills. A marriage takes a lot of work, but it's work that pays off. I remember my husband and I recently, we were talking about you know, different things that we wanna invest in. A marriage is investment. You're investing in a greater reward in so many different ways that marriages can benefit you. When you're putting in the work and your children are able to see how you effectively communicate and problem solve, and they then grow up with that same skill, not that you have to teach it to them, they're just seeing it through your marriage. That's an investment. When you're able to raise children that are emotionally competent, they know how to problem solve and they know how to manage and deal with their emotions, and they're just not like all over the place and, you know what I'm saying, getting themselves into trouble after trouble because of the pattern that you've set in place for them, that's a great investment. And I remember my husband and I, we, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were just thinking about different ways to like invest and be more um, financial, make really good financial decisions. And there was this one investment that we were looking at. And at first I wasn't very confident about investing in it, but we did our homework and we did our research. And when, I inv when we invested, about maybe like three or four months later, the investment literally went from double digits to triple digits. So you know that was a good investment. And the only regret, regret that we had three months later was that we didn't invest more. So when you make an investment, you're looking at the long-term effect of that investment and how it's gonna profit you. And the greatest thing that marriage does, it sends a message to the world that Jesus Christ is the difference. Jesus Christ's, Jesus Christ's relationship to the body of Christ is a beautiful thing. And the reason why our marriage can work the way that it works is because we have the mind of Christ. And if we have the mind of Christ, that means that we're giving birth to things that looks like Christ. And when people in the world see that, they should be coming to the church and saying, what is your how? Then the church becomes so attractive knowing that we are the answer. So I'm gonna leave with this. It, it was in a survey um, conducted among 351 couples assessing what made their marriage work. And 300 of those 351 couples identified with having a happy marriage. And the top statement that participants selected that reflected why their marriage was lasting and happy were. And it's not saying that they didn't have struggles, but they were able to maintain that level of happiness because there's certain things that they um, identified with. And one, my spouse is my best friend. I actually like my spouse as a person. How many people don't like their spouse as a person? <laughs> Sometimes one time I was in a session and I, the, the girl like literally like turned and like looked at her, her husband. I was like, ooh, that's not, I didn't want to point it out because I don't think he saw it. But we also do individual sessions together. And I was like, what was that look about? She's like, I really don't like him. <laughs> so this one is like, I like my spouse as a person. And marriage is a long-term commitment. So when nothing else is able to keep you, your commitment and the vows that you made first and foremost, what did I say? <laughs> first and foremost to Jesus Christ. That's your commitment right there. That even if you don't like your spouse, Lord, crucify self and help me to love and like this person that agape maybe you know that filet of love may not be present right now but that agape love if you can really fill me up with that so I can love this man and I don't like when people say I love you but I don't like you you how you gonna love me but you don't like me you gotta like me first even to want to get to know me to then love me so that's all people just be saying some things and I'd be like mm, that's not no that's not it Another statement is marriage is a long term. I said that one already, sorry. Marriage is sacred. Another other said, we agree on aims and goals. And there's nothing like having aims and goals together. Coming together and setting short-term and long-term goals. Coming together and assessing your goals together. 
I'm not saying that marriage needs to be like a business, but there are certain principles and practices in business that you can bring to your marriage that can be very beneficial. We laugh together. I tell my husband all the time, we need play. Play is really important, not just for children, but for adults and for married couples. I am proud of my spouse's achievements. We agree on a philosophy, so we need to be on the same page. We discuss things calmly, not with anger, like the couple I was telling you about. We couldn't do nothing. I told him, I was like, don't talk about anything. Don't say a word to each other about this thing until we come back next week, because you don't have the ability to be able to discuss things calmly. And we agree on how often to show affection. I don't know too much about that last statement because affection to me sometimes just gotta be in the moment. Like we're not gonna plan to be affectionate. It's either we are or we're not. But according to them, they agree on how and how often to show affection. So these are tools that we have that's gonna help us to prepare for marriage but also sustain us throughout the process of marriage. And also remembering that it always begins and ends with the Lord Jesus Christ. He has the power to keep us and to sustain us. So I hope you all were blessed. Yeah.